arrive as a result. It's just we have to get the rest of the world out there to come in line with us so it becomes easier. So every place you go, there's a, a healthy option so you have to fight all the time to stay alive. I'm sorry. As I mentioned, uh, people know me as a diet doctor, but uh, I want you to know me just as a regular doctor. And one of the one of the more difficult things that I over the years is to try and uh, try and put various tests and treatments into perspective for patients. Uh, I know lots of people have thought that I was well. I guess quack would probably be the word, or certainly anti anti medicine, or. Or, or maybe even okay. causing people harm, and and uh, I don't know where my self-interest would be when I would suggest that you shouldn't you shouldn't put much, if any, emphasis on the common tests that are prescribed these days, particularly mammography and PSA tests. And I, I know I've lost some friends that way, but as as time goes on, the truth does surface. And when I find somebody along the way that has the, uh, the position, the knowledge to teach me things and to give me confidence in what I'm doing and to further my understanding of what I intuitively believe to be correct or the bits I glean from the literature, I'm, I'm just so pleased to have that person come into my life. And this is one of the most major things that I've ever been involved in, at least, at least secondary to the dietary issue is the idea that uh, doing these early detection testings, uh, hoping to be saved against all odds, uh, is, is something that, that needs to be stopped, and I've tried to tell you that. <clears throat> there are a few men and women along the way who uh, read the same science and understood it better than I have, who I also had the opportunity to communicate this in the, in the form that doctors <coughs> best understand, scientists best understand, which is in the scientific literature, and there's no better way to communicate than to have have the opportunity to write your ideas in the New England Journal of Medicine, the Journal of the National Cancer Institute, the Journal of the American Medical Association. I could go on and on. So when I see these ideas that I'm you know, trying to learn about and trying to share with you expressed with great clarity and confidence too that this is right, when I see an author bring that kind of knowledge and willing to share it because it's dangerous to share this kind of knowledge particularly when the economic interests are so high. And then when I find somebody that has credibility of, of the, uh, the most important universities in the country and the attention of the most prestigious journals in the world, when I have a, a chance to meet that person in print, I get really excited. And then I go after him. <laughs> and then I start writing them emails. And uh, do whatever I can to convince them that we have a great audience. Uh, an audience that's well worth traveling all the way from the East Coast to come out and, and talk to and to share with and to get to know a little bit. And it was um, with that kind of discovery that I met our next, next speaker. And with that kind of enthusiasm that I pursued him uh, almost uh, weekly at times. And eventually I guess he got tired of listening to me and he decided that it would be uh, an easy trip, an easier to come there. <laughs> and so he gave in and uh, Traveled all across the country to our beautiful state, which he loves very much. And I, I, I can't tell you how excited I am about our next speaker. Who, uh, this is a man who's changing the world. You, if you read the science, if you read the newspapers, well, you'll find him in your daily newspapers, probably monthly his name mentioned. And if you read the scientific literature, you'll find his articles prominent. And telling you things that you never heard before. With great pleasure, I'd like to introduce Dr. H. Gilbert Welch from Dartmouth. Wow. All I can say is this guy better be good. <laughs> God. Thanks for lowering expectations there, buddy. Thank you. Uh, I'm very uh, happy to be here. Uh, anyone from New England here? Or am I? All right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, I'm not from New England. I'm from <laughs> I'm from Colorado. But uh, <laughs> but I've been there for 20 years, and I love it. Uh, and uh, but I also love the West, and I'm very happy 
to be in the great state of California, and there's nothing like driving over the Golden Gate. How many drove over the Golden Gate today? Yeah, there's just nothing like it. Uh, there's absolutely nothing like it. So, uh, Dr. McDougall told you just a little bit about uh, me, but let me start uh, by telling you my background. <laughs> 56 years ago, I was born a privileged white child, and it is what it is. I mean, I can't, you know, I can't deny what I am, um, and this is me. Uh, this is a picture my mother took on Kodachrome. You remember that, you know, this is a, and my mother died recently, and I was going through, and I found this slide, and then so I, now you have to digitize it, so you don't. And this is uh, actually in Alexandria, Virginia, where I was at the time, not that I remember much about it. Are there some doctors in the room? Just to raise, okay, G gl glad to have you here. You immediately recognize there's a number of things wrong with this child, <laughs> right? I mean, um, <clears throat> clearly overweight, <laughs> right? There's no question about that. Um, probably has toddler hypertension, uh, hyperlipidemia for sure, uh, glucose intolerance undoubtedly. But, you know, really look at that face. Is there a pediatrician in the audience? I, I mean, there's a word for it. It's a funny looking kid. Um, and I undoubtedly have a bunch of single nucleotide polymorphisms. These are what's in the genome a couple of genetic uh, variants, and maybe even a frame shift mutation. But the real question is, what's going on down there? <laughs> wow, what is lurking in that belly? Could that be an abdominal aortic aneurysm? <laughs> Boy, I'm glad I was born 56 years ago. Uh, this is a much more recent picture. This is O'Hare Airport. Uh, anybody fly through O'Hare? Uh, well, this is right in the airport. It's an ad for IBM, and this is a new world we live in, and in medical circles, we have to be very careful to disclose our conflicts of interest, and I am a shareholder of IBM. <laughs> Although the pictures you're seeing are being uh, projected by a Mac. Um, <coughs> but, Seriously look at this because this is the real question I'm going to be bringing up tonight. This is what IBM thinks would be good, is medical history to alert doctors before patients get sick. And most people read that and they assume, of course, that's a good thing, right? Of course, let's alert doctors before people get sick. Until you think about it a minute, you're thinking, man, those doctors are going to be alerted a lot, aren't they? They're going to be alerted all the time. <laughs> but as I go through my talk with you tonight, I want you to think about this, because this is a very big presumption that it would be good to alert doctors before you get sick. So the topic of my talk is uh, overdiagnosed, and the, the, the subtitle is Making People Sick in the Pursuit of Health. And, and it's, it's really, I'm criticizing my own profession here, uh, it, what's become a very basic uh, paradigm. And, and it's a presumption, and it's a widespread presumption, that the best strategy to keep people healthy is through early diagnosis. And it, it, you just hear it everywhere. The earlier, the better, and, and, and so on and so forth. And that's what I'm going to be questioning uh, with you uh, tonight. A couple of disclaimers before I uh, begin. The views expressed here do not necessarily represent the views of the Department of Veterans Affairs or the United States government. Now this could be said of many of my views, um, but I should also say that I have been a proud uh, federal employee, and I'm not joking, I started in the U.S. Public Health Service, I've worked for the VA uh, for about 27 uh, years. But it is clear my views do not necessarily uh, represent the views of the Department of Veterans Affairs or the United States government. Um, the second disclaimer is because the, my interest is to give you a sense of what I see at least as the breadth of the problem. This will be a cursory review. So 
Think of this as a, a mile wide but only an inch deep. If there's more you want to know, um, I'm happy to talk about uh, specific issues in more depth, but I I'm purposely going to be doing sort of a broad survey uh, of where I see the problems. Another disclaimer, I have a book on the topic. It's called Overdiagnosed, Making People Sick in the Pursuit of Health. I have another book on the topic, Should I Be Tested for Cancer? Maybe not, and here's why. Uh, that was written about uh, seven uh, years ago. Um, I do actually have no financial interest in these uh, books. Uh, what proceeds uh, uh, all go to Upper Valley Charities. I live in the Upper Valley of, Con the, uh, upper valley of uh, the Connecticut River, which is right between uh, New Hampshire and Vermont. And I made a decision a long time ago that you know, I didn't want to be making money off this because it's not a particularly uh, happy uh, message. But I do have a, and, and by the way, for those, I, I, well, first let me say, you know, I, I'd be happy if you'd read it. I have a professional interest in having you read it. I, I also want to be clear, because some of you may think, boy, that guy's a really generous guy. Um, we're not talking about a lot of money here, either. <laughs> uh, so, I, 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 I want to be clear about that. By the way, cheap copies are, are available. Um, uh, that's because I make my students read these books. And here, here, here's a picture of, uh, I teach epidemiology and biostatistics at Dartmouth. And um, I, y you know, this guy did not do very well in the class. It's, um, I, I'm not sure. Uh, but anyway, the minute they're through the book, they put them up on eBay or, or Amazon or whatever. So you can get them cheap. Okay, uh, here's an overview. I want to give you a sort of a game plan where we're going to go this evening. Um, I'll start with what is overdiagnosis, because it actually has a, a, a relatively formal uh, definition. Um, I'll talk about mechanisms for overdiagnosis, and, and I break them into these categories. We change the rules. We refers to physicians. We change the rules. We're able to see more. Uh, we look harder and we stumble onto things. And those are the four basic uh, mechanisms, and I'll flesh them out for you. And then at the end, I'll, I'll talk about how I think we need to uh, move forward. So let's get going. What is overdiagnosis? It is the detection of an asymptomatic abnormality or condition. And that asymptomatic part is key. Patient has no symptoms. Patient feels well. So it's the detection of an asymptomatic Sometimes we call them abnormality, sometimes we call them conditions, sometimes people even attach the word disease. That either A will never progress, or in fact it will regress, never progress to cause symptoms, or it will progress slowly enough that the patient dies of other causes before symptoms appear. I've got news for you, we're all gonna die, right? So something that is progressing so slowly that it never has a chance to cause symptoms is equally a problem if we're overdiagnosing. Note that overdiagnosis is typically a side effect of what we've been taught to believe is the right way to practice medicine. Detect and treat disorders before they cause problems. That's the only way we get into this mess, right? If we try to find things before they cause problems, we run into this problem, that we may pick up things that will never matter. So, I, I, I gotta be clear that there's a conundrum here. It's not as simple as, uh, like, well, we'll never do it. Um, the conundrum is, clinicians can never know who is overdiagnosed at the time of diagnosis. It's not like a pe person has a label, I'm overdiagnosed, I, I'm not overdiagnosed. So, Clinicians don't know which patients are overdiagnosed. Overdiagnosis is only confirmed in an individual if that individual is never treated and goes on to die from some other cause. Then you know that was an unnecessary diagnosis. You never did anything about it, patient went on, lived their life, dies, and never had experienced a problem from that abnormality or condition. Not surprisingly, that doesn't happen a lot. Sometimes it does, some things we just watch, but it doesn't happen very often. So the tendency is for us to treat everybody once we make the diagnosis, thereby pr producing the major harm 
of overdiagnosis. Treatment that cannot help because there's nothing to fix, right? I mean, if you're never going to experience the symptoms or have a problem with the diagnosis, treatment can't help you because you were never going to have a problem. Treatment that instead can only lead to harm. And the reality is all of our treatments have some harms, some more than others, for sure, and some of the harms are relatively minor, but they all have some harm. So that's the background. Let me step back and say, yeah, well, how did this happen? What, what, where did this start? What, what's the genesis of the problem? And it's in the detection and treatment of hypertension. And I'm always nervous when I say that because, particularly to physicians, because physicians will say, well, you know, high, treating high blood pressure is one of the most important things we do. And yes, it is one of the most important things to do. But at the same time, we're also overdiagnosing the problem. So both things can go on at the same time. Let me tell you why it is very important to treat very high blood pressure. And I'm going to share with you one study in a little bit of detail so you understand how we do studies. And it's a VA study. It's a cooperative study. It involved multiple VA hospitals and it's in the mid-1960s. And it's a randomized trial. And I'll tell you a little bit of how that works. You, you recruit patients and to get in this study, we were talking about males, because the VA was largely only treating males in the 60s, with diastolic blood pressure, that's the DBP, elevated in the hospital, diastolic blood pressure elevation. They had to pass a test of outpatient compliance. They had to demonstrate they would take medicines while they felt well. And I'll come back to that test in a little bit. Um, and their average outpatient diastolic blood pressure was 115 to 129. XXX over 115 to 129. Okay, really, really high blood pressure. Really high blood pressure. So, they get randomized. Um, Uh, they're going to be randomized into two groups, one where they get two drugs and the other group will get a placebo. It's a classic randomized trial. They're followed for 1.5 years, which is a relatively short period of time. And then after that, we're going to measure the outcomes, the differences between the two groups. And you can see in the first column is the placebo group with 73 patients, and the second column is the group taking two drugs with 70 patients. So it's a small trial, less than 150 uh, patients. And we're now talking about men whose diastolic blood pressures are over 115. <coughs> Death. There were four deaths in the placebo group. There were none in the two drug groups. There were four stro strokes in the placebo group. There was one in the group taking drugs. There are four cases of heart failure in the placebo group. There were none in the two drugs group. There were two heart attacks in the placebo group. There were none in the two drugs group. There was three cases of kidney failure in the placebo group. There were none in the two drugs group. There were seven eye hemorrhages, retinal hemorrhages in the placebo group. There were none in the two drug group. There was one person uh, hospitalized, uh, three people hospitalized for high, uh, high blood pressure in the placebo group, and there were none in the two drug groups. And treatment complications, well luckily there were no treatment complications in the placebo group. <laughs> but there was one in the two drug group. Now I know it's after dinner, um, I won't make you do the math. Uh, <clears throat> That's 27 events, and these aren't trivial events, right? These are really important events versus two. Y you know what? You don't even need a statistician here. This is highly, highly significant. This isn't the role of chance. It's a really important thing to intervene on people with really high blood pressure. So I want, want to be, have that absolutely clear. Let's come back to this test of outpatient compliance, because the, the VA investigators were actually very careful here. They, were, they wanted to make sure that people were going to take the medicine. So before they could even be randomized, patients were given two placebos, one which makes the urine fluoresce, fluorescent color, and they were seen twice in follow-up 
to count the pills to make sure they had taken all the pills and they had to pee in a cup and make sure that in fact they were ingesting that placebo. So it was very carefully done. Nearly half the patients failed that test of compliance. That's really important historical piece of information. Why? People at that point did not take medicines when they felt well. It was a new thing. It was a new idea. People only took medicines when they felt sick. Taking medicines when you felt well was a whole new idea. For context, now a typical randomized trial of a drug therapy, compliance rates will be well over 90%, 95, 96%. So this was a real frame shift, the idea of treating something when people felt well. Hypertension marks the beginning of intervention on asymptomatic patients, and it's right around the late 1960s. So now let's get to overdiagnosis. First mechanism, we change the rules. And by changing rules, we're, we're, we're changing the numbers and the cutoffs which lead doctors to make a diagnosis and to treat. I call them, or I don't just call them, you know, we, we call them diagnostic thresholds and treatment thresholds. At what point will we treat? So let me give you an example. Um, when I was in medical school, oh, yeah, right, this is, is it, nothing worse for medical students to hear the professor going, when I was in medical school. But when I was in medical school, we only treated blood pressure if the diastolic blood pressure was over 100. In fact, when I was in medical school, we didn't even know about the systolic blood pressure. That was news. And that, that, that's not true, but we didn't know it was important. We thought it was just a problem with hard, hard pipes. Now, um, <clears throat> we treat and make the diagnosis in people who have a blood pressure over 140, over 90. And I get feedback at the VA that looks like this, which some of which I really like. The top line is, is telling me about how I'm doing with my patients. And the top lines are telling me about people with really, really high blood pressure, people I'd like to uh, know about. Um, but down at the bottom, there, there's people who have, quote, moderate problem. Um, and I know it's hard to uh, uh, read that. Um, let me change this clicker if I can. This is not <coughs> responding. Apologize for the technical. if I can get that to work. Um, so I'm talking about a blood pressure here of 142 over 64 in an 80-year-old man who lives alone. And I have similar ones, and I'm kind of going, are you kidding me? Am I, am I supposed to be doing something for these patients? Reminder, the views expressed here do not necessarily <laughs> represent the views of the Department of Veterans Affairs or the United States government. We've done a lot of studies of high blood pressure, and I want to give you some sense of that information. And I'm going to talk about here on the bottom various levels of blood pressure. On the far right, you see severe high blood pressure. That's a diastolic of 115 to 129. That's the VA cooperative study I just showed you. Then we have trials with moderate high blood pressure, 115 to 114. We have a trial of mild, 90 to 104, and very mild. 
That's the spectrum of high blood pressure, the spectrum of abnormality from very severe to mild. And on the y-axis, I'm going to show you the annual rate of death and end organ damage. That's the stuff we were talking about on that first slide. Things like dying, things like having a stroke, things like having congestive heart failure, all those same outcomes. And here are what happens in the control group, the group that gets placebo. And you probably aren't very surprised by that. If you have really high blood pressure, you have a high rate of these bad events, death and end organ damage. If you have moderate, you have a lower rate. If you have mild, you have a lower rate. And if you have very mild, you have a yet lower rate. So in other words, the risk of bad things happening from the disease is in direct relationship to how severe that disease is. This is what happened in the intervention groups in these randomized trials. And you'd say, why aren't they all at the same level? Because real data are ugly. Real data don't always look exactly the way you'd expect. But the main point is the difference between those two curves is the benefit of treatment. That's the benefit of treatment. And so let me just take that away and just show you these bars. And all it's saying is the benefit of treating someone with really severe high blood pressure is much, much higher than someone with a moderate blood pressure elevation, which is higher than some, treating someone with a mild blood pressure elevation. So I, I'm big on drawings and so forth. And, and, and I just want to make a kind of a cartoon of this, where the spectrum of abnormality from a mild abnormality to a severe one to, to say, you know, in borderline hypertension to severe hypertension, that this is what treatment benefit looks like. It's much higher on the severe side. The ability to treat is much more important than on the borderline side. Yeah. Pretty simple, right? Now, the next thing I said to you at the very beginning is all of our treatments have harms. And I'm going to put up this line for treatment harm. And we can debate a little bit how harm relates to the spectrum of abnormality. But the only thing important for my argument is that the treatment harm isn't as tightly related to the spectrum of abnormality. It's relatively flatter. It's, it's not as dramatically connected to how sick the patient is. In fact, in blood pressure, you might argue that, that the treatment harm looks like this. That the person most likely to be harmed is way over on the left of the graph because you're going to make his or her blood pressure too low. But I don't want to get into the exact debate about the slope of that curve. All I'm arguing is it's not as steep as the treatment benefit curve. And if that's true, then we've got two possibilities. We do have an area where there's a net benefit to treatment, but there's also an area where there's a net harm to treatment treatment. And so we got to be careful about moving too far to the left. That's all I'm trying to say. Now, in diabetic patients, people are even more aggressive. The JNC7 uh, says that we should get blood pressures below 130. And the American Diabetes Association says there is no threshold value for blood pressure. No threshold value? I don't think so. Uh, no threshold value? But this is the way we're beginning to think. Oh, it's just whatever it is, lower, 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 lower. So my question is, you know, if it's important to treat people over 140, what happens if you say we got to treat and get everybody down below 120? Do we begin to cross that line where we're beginning to do net harm? By the way, don't miss the fact that from moving from 140 to 120, all of a sudden you involve a whole bunch more patients. Right? You, you involve a whole bunch more of the entire population. So there was a study that looked at this. It's called the INVEST study. Go figure. I'm not making it up. It's called the INVEST study. <laughs> Um, and it's the International Verapamil SR and Trandolapril study. Everybody see where INVEST comes from? Yeah? 
You think you do, huh? Uh, well, it's I-N-V-E-S-T. We really work hard on our acronyms. And I showed this slide actually at the Massachusetts General Hospital. And um, one of the cardiologists said, Gil, I can get something better out of this. Uh, I got uh, insanity. I N S A N. But this is actually a good study. It's a randomized trial. It's in patients with diabetes and coronary artery disease. And what I'm going to show you is all cause mortality, death from any cause in this trial. And we're going to compare it to people who have their blood pressure lowered to 125 to 130. And if you get to 120 to 125, you get another five points lower, you don't see any effect on mortality. You get to 115 to 120, it's a little bit higher mortality, but it's not statistically significant. Those are error bars uh, there. You get to 110 to 115, whoa! All of a sudden that's 1.5 times, that little dot is 1.5 times higher. It's almost statistically significant. And under 110, it's over two times, and it's totally not due to chance. It's a problem. And it's not rocket science. It's not that good to have a blood pressure that's too low. It's amazing. It's sort of the first thing you learn in medical school. You know, patients do need blood pressure. If I didn't have blood pressure, I couldn't stand up in front of you. So that's high blood pressure. We lower the threshold. We include more patients, all as part of this effort to diagnose early. How about diabetes? When I was in medical school, diabetes was defined as a fasting blood sugar greater than 140. Now it's been redefined as a fasting blood sugar greater than 126. There's been a lot of interest, I'd say excessive interest, in aggressively treating diabetics. The marker we use to follow diabetics is the hemoglobin A1C. And that's a measure of sort of average blood sugar over the last two or three months. The original goal was to get people somewhere between seven and nine. And then doctors said, no, 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 we should try to get the normal. And we think that a normal hemoglobin A1C is below six that it would be better if we could make a diabetic patient look like a normal patient. So is good control good for patients? Well, there's a study that came out in The Lancet about a year ago that looked at 48,000 patients with established type 2 diabetes. They had had the disease for the mean was a, a five years duration and they were undergoing intensification of therapy to improve glucose control. Their mean hemoglobin A1C at the start of the study was 9.5 percent. That's high. They are poorly controlled diabetics. And the question is, how does it help to lower them more? So the exposure is going to be how well the doctors were able to lower the blood sugar. What is the hemoglobin A1C after you've added insulin or increased the oral uh, hypoglycemic agents. The outcome of interest is what does that do to the overall rate of death? This is the most complicated figure I'm going to show you tonight. Are you ready? Okay. So on the bottom, I'm telling you how well the doctors did in lowering their blood sugar. That's the mean hemoglobin A1C after adding all these medications. On the y-axis, I'm going to show you the relative rate of death from all causes. And one is the magic number where there's no change. Anything above one says there's an increased risk of death. Anything below one is a decreased risk of death. And I'll shade it a little differently so you can see it. The so-called referent group, what we're going to be comparing everybody against, is at 7.5 which is sort of the old standard. That's where we used to shoot. To, that was our goal for diabetics. Now, if you couldn't quite get them to 7.5, you weren't able to quite get that much uh, good control, but you were able to keep them under 9, 
you saw a little bit of an increase in mortality, but none of it was significant. It all could have been due to chance, despite the fact there are over 200 deaths in each group. This is a big study. It's 44,000. If you can't get them under nine, all of a sudden you see what you'd expect to see. It's, it's bad to have uncontrolled diabetes. It's bad to have it. It does lead to an increased rate of death. But what if you got them more like normal? What if you move them more like normal? Well, gosh, you also increase the risk of death. And again, it's not that complicated. It's not good to have a glucose that's too low. And Dr. McDougall mentioned, we're worried about these medicines can harm people. They can, the problem is we can't dial your blood sugar exactly. If we get the average low, that means sometimes you're too low. And in fact, this was confirmed in a randomized trial done by the NIH where they stopped the trial because they realized there was an increased mortality risk with trying to make diabetics look like normal patients. So it's not just hypertension and diabetes. High cholesterol. When I was in medical school, we thought a high cholesterol was a total cholesterol over 300. Now, having a detectable cholesterol <laughs> is considered abnormal. All right, that's a little bit of an overstatement, but not a very big one, right? I mean, not a very big one. And I know some of the physicians in the room will say this is a gross simplification, but our goal is around 200. And, and of course, we do, we, we fractionate uh, cholesterol. We look at HDL relative to LDL, and we, we, we do ratios, and we make it a lot more complicated. But no one will argue with me the threshold to intervene on cholesterol has dropped dramatically over the last uh, 20 years. And, and then there's osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is defined by a T-score. And that's that me measure of bone min mineral density. And to have osteoporosis, you had to have a T-score that was below minus 2.5. I know, this is tough. So now we've got decimals and we've got negative numbers. <laughs> I know, but, but that was a pretty tough definition for the disease. Now, they redefined osteoporosis, and you've got to have a T-score less than minus 2.0. And you're thinking, well, come on, what's 0.5 between friends? What, what do these things mean? What, I mean, you're seeing, you're seeing all these numbers. What do they mean in terms of how many people are involved? And my colleagues and I did a paper on this about three or four years ago you know, estimating how many Americans were affected using the federal survey data that tells us the distribution of these variables of how many people became patients because of these changing definitions. In high blood pressure, it's over 13 million. In diabetes, it's about 2 million. The change in cholesterol is 42 million. And that little 0.5 change that only applies to women over age 60 mean, meant literally overnight 7 million American women developed the diagnosis of osteoporosis. So that's us changing the rules. That's what I mean by changing. Changing the definition of what we consider abnormal. Now the second mechanism is we're able to see more. This is a chest x-ray. This is how we used to diagnose lung cancer. And, and you can see the heart in the middle, and then on both sides you see the darkness is the lung. And you see that big thing there. That shouldn't be there. That's a big lung cancer. It's about 10 centimeters in size. This is how we diagnose lung cancer today. This is a spiral CT scan. And this is a lung, it is a magnification of one section of the lung, and that is a small lung cancer. It's about a one centimeter in size lesion. Now, the one thing I can tell you is there are a lot more of these on the right than there are of those big ones. This is a barium enema. This is how we used to diagnose colon cancer. And one of the first things you learn in medical school when you're looking at x-rays is the problem is where the arrow is. So everybody sees, sees the arrow? Okay. 
And, and the problem there is you're looking at colon, but you're not seeing the barium in it. You don't see the white. So, so that's called a, a, a filling defect. And, and I can uh, fill it in for you. That's a large polyp. That's what a large polyp looks like on a barium enema. And that's about 10 centimeters in size. Now, this is how we look for colon cancer today. This is a colonoscopy. This is taken through the scope. And that's a small polyp. It's about a one centimeter polyp. And this is a virtual colonoscopy on the same patient. And that's the same polyp. You're looking actually at two different images of the same polyp. One's a picture, one's a reconstructed image. And again, the one thing we know for sure, there are a lot more of these than there are of those. There are a lot more small polyps than there are big ones. And my gastroenterology colleagues now are removing polyps a third this size now. They're really going after very small polyps, and there are lots of very small polyps. This is an x-ray of the breast, a plain film diagnostic mammogram, a technology that's been around since 1960. We would now say this is an outdated technology, but it sure could see an obvious breast cancer, and that is an obvious breast cancer. It's about two centimeters in size. This is what a mammogram looks like today. This is a digital mammogram, and of course it can be rotated in space, it can be enlarged, it can be shaded and thick. Everybody see the abnormality there? What's wrong with you people? <laughs> There's no arrow. I'm sorry, I forgot the arrow. Yeah. There it is, I'll, 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 I'll blow it up for you. And it's literally pixels in size. Um, it, it's about 0.02 centimeters in size. These are the microcalcifications that now trigger about a third of the biopsies in this country. These are the microcalcifications associated with the earliest form of breast cancer, the form that probably we shouldn't have attached the word cancer to, but ductal carcinoma in situ, or DCIS. And the one thing we know is there are a whole lot more of these than there are of those. So we've got a general problem. What does it mean for us to be able to see more? This isn't our fault. It's General Electric's fault, <laughs> or Siemens' fault, or IBM's fault. You know? But so this isn't something doctors are purposely doing. It's just like that's our abilities are fundamentally changing. Well, let me ask you a you know, seemingly unrelated question. How many lakes are in the state of Utah? OK, wait a second. A lot of you from California. OK, that's Utah. All right. Anybody from Utah here? Idaho, that's close. That's close. We're going to come to Idaho in a minute. How many lakes in the state of Utah? One. You see it. What is it? Who's been in the Great Salt Lake? Yeah, wow, you got a lot of grades. Yeah, it, it's a great lake. Um, there's one from the continental view, and you can see it from space. You can see it from space. But let's zoom in to a statewide view, and all of a sudden you wait, whoa, 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 there's more than one, right? There is the Great Salt Lake. That's just to the north uh, uh, west of Salt Lake City. There is Utah Lake down by Provo, underneath Mount Timpanogos, and then up on the Idaho border, is uh, Bear Lake up there at three. There are three lakes that you can see at the state level. Everything else you see that's blue is actually a reservoir. Um, but let's look at this east-west mountain range, the High Uinta, and just look at one satellite view of the High Uinta and ask the question, how many lakes are there in the state of Utah? Well, all of a sudden you say, wow, they're, they're, they're there are all sorts of lakes there. there there's, there's lakes all over in the mountains of Utah. In this image alone, there are about 35 lakes. And this is about six uh, by six miles. So how many lakes are there in the state of Utah? Well, the continental view, there's one. If you move to the state level view, you see three. And if you move to just one section of the high you went to, you find 39 plus. So that comes back to the basic question, how many lakes? And the answer depends on the resolution of the map. Right? It's a totally a function of how well you can see. As you're able to see more, you find more. 
And you can see that's what's happening with our imaging. As you can able to see more, of course you find more. But the typical lake gets a lot smaller. And that's really important. Right? That one lake you see from the satellite view is very different than the lakes you're able to see when you get a lot closer. So the typical lakes change in size. And it's a lot less important. If you're looking for a water source, not that the Great Salt Lake's a great water source, so maybe that's not a, but they're much smaller lakes. Now you might say, well, what does this have to do with medicine? You know, I, I think of the continental view as being what doctors do when they talk to patients, obtain a history, and do a basic physical exam. The Utah view is sort of the old technology like a chest x-ray. Uh, the, the high you interviews like a spiral CT. And we're sort of moving down where we're seeing more and more information. How many people have had a stroke? This is an unbelievable study. It's part of the Framingham study, which has been a massive cohort study done for about 40 years in Framingham, Massachusetts. And they did MRIs on people who were otherwise well. Asymptomatic. They had no symptoms. 15% of people aged 70 to 89 had MRI evidence of having a lacunar stroke. 60 to 69, 10% had evidence. In my age group, 50 to 59, 8% of us, asymptomatic, have stroke. And then unbelievably, in the 30 to 49, 7% have evidence of the stroke. Now, have we just changed the definition of a lake to include a puddle? That's one of the questions you have to ask. You know, what used to be a stroke was something that people that had a symptom, had a clear, obvious symptom. If we use the MRI as the standard of what constitutes a stroke, all of a sudden, everybody, or not everybody, but a lot of people have the disorder. Then we look harder. Uh, this is Medicare data. We do a lot of Medicare data at Dartmouth. This is the one place where we can see what's happening across the country. The number of brain CTs has uh, doubled over the last 15 years. Uh, the number of abdominal CTs are up uh, threefold. The number of uh, chest CTs are up fivefold. And the number of brain spine MRIs are up fivefold. We're just doing, we're doing a lot more cross-sectional imaging than we used to. And then we encourage the well to get examined to determine if they are not, in fact, sick. You have to think about that, but we encourage the well, we invite them in to get thoroughly examined to see whether they're not, in fact, sick. Um, that's screening. Now, this is the kind of image, um, well, it's a wonderful image. Uh, it's a young woman, uh, and it's very artsy, and you can see the uh, you know, sort of the graphical displays and the squares and sort of all the soft pastel colors. And it's a pretty uh, woman and she's writing in a nice calligraphy or something. It, it won't happen to me. I go to the gym every morning. I walk to the office and I don't let work stress me out. In other words, she's doing everything she can. She's doing all the right things. And then in the fine, small, you have to look at it real carefully. Alicia Fox, 21, the day before she was diagnosed with thyroid cancer. Now, this is the kind of thing that makes my blood pressure high. Because what is this ad designed to do? Scare the hell out of you, right? You're doing everything right the day before you have thyroid cancer. So at the outset, I say, is that a good thing for a healthcare system to be doing? You know, you're doing everything right, and the next day you get thyroid. Now, in case you missed the message, and, and the fonts are small, so I'll put them up here. The next word is confidence kills. Now, that's a good message to get out there, isn't it? <laughs> if you feel good about yourself, something's wrong with you. Right? What a horrible message, isn't it? And it goes on. Thyroid cancer doesn't care how healthy you are. Um, it can happen to anyone, including you. <laughs> That's why it's the fastest growing cancer in the United States. OK, now, wait, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> Flesh out the logic here, OK? Let's go. <laughs> Thyroid cancer doesn't care how healthy you are. It can happen to anyone, including you. That's why it's the fasting growing. 
I, I don't, like, I, I, who wrote this? Ask your doctor to check your neck. <laughs> oh, oh, wait a minute, I see there was an editing problem. I think there was an editing, I think there was, a, I think if we put, ask your doctor to check your neck, that's why it's the fastest <laughs> one. Right? That's why it's the fastest growing cancer. It is, by the way, one of the fastest growing cancers in the United States. But let's see why that is. So the next series of slides I'm going to show you are all going to kind of look the same. It's going to have years on the bottom from 1975 to 2005. And this is 1975 is when the federal government started to carefully track cancer incidence and mortality in this country through the SEER program. And on the y-axis, you're going to see the rate, how often these are happening in various years. And this is what's happening to thyroid cancer. It was fairly stable until the 90s. And then all of a sudden, the number of new cases doubled. The rate at which thyroid cancer, and it, and it is, it's one of the fastest growing cancers in the United States. Now, but if this was an epidemic of true disease, of, of real disease, what would I expect would happen to the death rate? Well, if it was really real disease, I'd expect the death rate to somehow track the incidence rate. If there was more real disease, I'd expect to see more people dying from the disease. Or, you know, maybe, maybe I'd see it start to track it and then all of a sudden it would turn when we developed a great new therapy or new intervention that, that, that could change that underlying burden. But in fact, what do I see? I see the most stable mortality rate in the SEER data. It doesn't budge an inch. It doesn't budge an inch. That doesn't look to me like an epidemic of disease. It really doesn't. It looks a lot more like an epidemic of diagnosis. And I think that's what it is. It, 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 in fact, we know there's, doctors are palpating more for thyroid nodules. We know they're doing a lot more ultrasounds and they're of the neck, and they're doing a lot more fine needle biopsies. This is an epidemic of diagnosis. And by the way, that's 2005. Now in 2008, the latest year of data, it, it's up to about 13. So it's continuing to happen. We're in the midst of a diagnostic epidemic in thyroid cancer. And does it matter? Yeah, it really does matter because most of these people have their thyroid taken out. You don't want to lose your thyroid if you don't need to. It does a lot of really important things. There's also a nerve right near the thyroid, the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Some patients are made hoarse by the uh, operation. Some have a little bit of vocal cord paralysis. There are also small glands behind the thyroid, the parathyroid glands. They have trouble with calcium metabolism. It is not something you want to have unnecessarily <coughs> diagnosed. And it, 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 it's, it's not just thyroid cancer. This is melanoma. This is the feared form of skin cancer. Right? You know, most skin cancers probably shouldn't be really called cancers, but melanoma can be a very aggressive cancer. But its mortality rate is fairly stable, the death rate from melanoma. But the rate of diagnosis is up over 2.5-fold. As we're biopsying more lesions, we're doing more, more and more punch biopsies all over the country. This is breast cancer. Breast cancer mortality has actually gone down a little bit. That's a good thing. There's nothing. Uh, I want to be absolutely clear that's a, absolutely a good thing. But the rate of diagnosis is up about 60% with the advent of mammography. And the poster child for the problem is prostate cancer. Uh, the death rate from prostate cancer is fairly stable, going down a little bit in recent years. But uh, nothing compared to what's happening to the incidence rate, uh, which is, you know, pops up and is up uh, dramatically. <coughs> and you should know, this kind of curve is really not the sort of thing we see in cancer epidemiology much. You know, kind of boom, bang, zoom, up and down and this kind of thing. You can't understand this curve by understanding cancer biology. You have to know something about the healthcare system that's involved here. And that big spike is the introduction of the PSA. Uh, and <clears throat> I have to say, there are places uh, wh where you see uh, this kind of curve. It tracks the NASDAQ uh, <laughs> very well over the same uh, period. But, um, 
Now, I want to be clear. I think screening has both benefits and harms. I think we've totally systematically exaggerated the benefits to screening, and we've downplayed, or worse yet, we've ignored uh, the harms. Let me give you my best take on what the benefit of screening mammography is uh, right now. And I have to start with a large denominator. I have to start with about 2,500 women, uh, age 50, undergoing annual mammography for a 10-year period of time. What are the benefits and harms of uh, undergoing annual mammography? Well, the benefit is somewhere between one and two, and I think it's closer to one, will avoid a breast cancer death. And that's a good thing. There's no question. You know, if that's right, that's a good thing. But what I've always been saying is, well, OK, we had to do that to 2,500 women. We ought to know what happens to the other 2,499. Right? It's important to know what happens to the rest of them. In this country, about 1,000 will have at least one false positive result. This is criminal. This would not happen in Europe. It is something about our radiologic threshold. It's something about our legal system. It's a number of different things. But it's ridiculous. No, no national screening program of a national health service would ever accept this kind of callback rate. It's unbelievable. About half of them have a biopsy. Some will have multiple biopsies. Some will never know that their breast is, in fact, normal. They're just left worrying about it. Some will go ahead to have a mastectomy because they just are tired of the biopsies and the worry. But, but most people know about that problem. What they don't know is somewhere between 5 to 15 will be overdiagnosed and treated unnecessarily for a cancer that was never going to bother them never going to bother. Now, you know, it's apples and oranges. Assume, this is my best guess of the magnitude of the benefits and the harms. And, and I've been studying this for about 10, 15 years. And it's still a guess where, where you know, we always have to never have as good data as you'd like. And I can't tell you what the right thing to do is here. All I can say is they're trade-offs. Um, and I can say this, does it make any sense that ensuring that all women do this has become one of the most prominent measures of healthcare system performance? I, are you kidding me? If this is the most important thing we do, we ought to close up shop. And yet it has become a very prominent performance measure about how many women you can get into your mammograms to get into your mammography suites. I think that makes no sense. Now, let me just take this away. The false positive program, problem most people know about. I, I want to focus on this mortality benefit, the death benefit, if you will, avoiding death, versus the overdiagnosis and unnecessary treatment harm. And I, I'm going to say the ratio at the low end, which I think is way too low, is maybe it's 1 versus 3. Uh, upwards to 1 to 15, something like that, that for every person who is able to avoid a breast cancer death, there are 15 women treated unnecessarily. That is the deal for breast cancer screening. The deal for prostate cancer screening is much worse. It's 1 to 30 or 1 to 100. Now, I want you to look at these numbers and, and, and sort of think, and you have to decide yourself how you feel about them. And you have to also understand what those overdiagnosed patients go through. I mean, they're receiving chemotherapy. They're receiving radiation. They're having side effects from surgery. It's, it's certainly not a picnic. But I think more important is for you to think about what it means to be a breast or prostate cancer survivor. Because you hear about them all the time, right? You, survivor stories, per, you know, they're just in the media every other day, right? You hear about a breast or prostate cancer survivor. And my question is, what does it mean to be a survivor following screening? Now, the standard interpretation is on the left side of the slide. It's someone who's had their life saved by screening. But as you can see from these ratios, the logical interpretation is, in fact, it's much more likely he or she was overdiagnosed. And this is a conundrum, isn't it? Because we all tend to interpret survivors as people who have benefited 
when in fact it's much more likely they represent people who have been harmed if they were screened, detected, breast or prostate cancer patients. That drives us towards more early detection, more overdiagnosis. The more intensive screening we do, the more overdiagnosis, and by more intensive I mean we do it more frequently, we have better images, we can see more detail, uh, more survivor stories there are out there, and the more useful screening appears to be. In fact, one screening advocate joked, you know, that all we need to do is detect a lot of people with cancer and screening will be very popular. Right? Because everyone knows, oh, she, you know, if, if I tell everybody here they have cancer and they all feel like they've benefited. But they have. So that's a popularity paradox. That's been called the popularity paradox of screening. Uh, this isn't just about cancer. I want to talk a little bit about pulmonary embolism. These are blood clots in the lung. And we're working hard to prevent them. It, in people in the hospital, we're giving them anticoagulants, we're giving them heparin and warfarin. And people, if they undergo surgery, get mechanical devices that, that sort of press on your leg or uh, press on your foot to try to keep the blood moving in your legs because these clots come from the legs. And we're measuring this effort. This is also part of performance measurement. The percent of surgery patients whose doctor orders treatments to prevent blood clots after certain types of surgery. That's a prominent measure of how good a hospital is. And it's definitely working. The death rate from pulmonary embolism since 1993 uh, from the CDC is down almost 40%. That's a good thing. Fewer patients are dying from pulmonary embolism. Now, I'm going to put the death rate down in a different scale, and it's still there. There's a 40% drop, and the reason I need to put all this extra room there is to show you how many new cases there are. Wow, now that's confusing, right? If we're doing so well at preventing pulmonary embolism, why is the number of new cases going? You know, we're trying to prevent them from occurring. Why are the number of new cases going? Well, it's again about our diagnostic abilities. This is how we used to diagnose a pulmonary emboli. This is a pulmonary angiogram and where the arrow, you know to look for the arrow, that's a large clot in a major pulmonary artery. It's about three centimeters in size. Now we diagnose the much smaller through spiral CT and they're about, this one's about 0.7 centimeters in size. And remember, there's always going to be a lot more small emboli than there are big ones. Big emboli kill people, make no mistake about it. Small ones don't. And it's important to distinguish between the two. And the reason is, and this is a picture of the heart and lungs, the embolus comes up, goes through the heart, and goes out the pulmonary artery, and they get stuck right when the minute the artery begins to split. And that means a whole lung isn't getting blood and you're not getting oxygen from that, that part of the lung and your blood pressure drops and it can be lethal. Little emboli get stuck out in the periphery of the lung and they, they, they probably don't matter any much. They're probably part of life. We probably all have small emboli from time to time. So again, this brings us back to the spectrum problem. You know, there's people who are clearly normal. There are people who have severe disease, but there's this in-between, you know, mild disease and trivial abnormality. And in this case, you have normal, you have a trivial embolus blood clot, a small blood clot, and a large blood clot. And that's deadly on the far right. That might cause symptoms, a little bit of shortness of breath. That's probably asymptomatic. There are very few of those. There are more of those. There are a lot more of those. So what do I think is going on here? Well, back then I think we had a few big emboli. That's what we were seeing. That's what the technology allowed us to see. Now I bet we have fewer big emboli, but we're finding a whole bunch of small ones. So my, my take home here is we're actually doing something good. We're preventing the big ones from forming. But we're also doing something bad. We're diagnosing a bunch of trivial emboli. And that means we're putting people on blood thinners who probably shouldn't be. 
And it's a problem because we can't distinguish from what's really bad from what's not. And then finally, we stumble onto things. <clears throat> As we do more and more of these exams, these cross-sectional imaging exams, we might be looking at your stomach, and just by chance, we find something on your kidney. And that happens a lot now. We're, we're, we're doing an x-ray study for one reason, but then we stumble onto something that has absolutely nothing to do with it, but now we feel like we've got to do something about it. And the doc doctors call this an incidentaloma. <laughs> they, we do. It's just, oh, she's got an incidentaloma. And it's causing a lot of problems for us. And one of the reasons we know about this is because there was a flurry of interest in whole body CT screening <clears throat> a number of years ago. And this is a study of, uh, of about 1,200 asymptomatic uh, volunteers. Their average age is 54. They're actually in r very good health. They all uh, could actually pay $1,000 for one of these things. Um, and 86% of them had at least one abnormality. Wow, what does that mean? The average patient had 2.8 abnormalities. There, the, the fact is we all harbor abnormalities in the liver, we harbor them in the lungs. You know, if we look hard enough, we'll find something in almost every organ in the body. So as you're able to see more, you find more. But remember, the typical lake gets a lot smaller and a lot less important. And how much less important? Well, to deal with this, I actually use actuarial reasoning from the 17th century and see if you can see what I'm doing here. But if 10% of people die from a cancer, ultimately, and 10% of people have the incidentaloma suggestive of cancer X, it's at least theoretically possible that everyone with an incidentaloma could die from it. You follow the logic? Right, you know, if 10% of people die from cancer, 10% of the people have the incidentaloma, it's possible that all the people with incidentaloma might die from that cancer. But if only 10% of people die from the cancer and 50% of people have an incidentaloma, then the most possible is that 20% of people could die from their incidentalomas. It's just a matter of, you know, there's not enough deaths for all the incidentalomas to be relevant. Well, it's with that logic that I do in the book, and I'll just take you to the end game here, give you my best guess of a lung cancer. Uh, 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 the chance that a lung nodule in a smoker is lung cancer is 3.6%. In a non-smoker, it's 0.7%. A kidney, a finding of a kidney cancer, it's a, a kidney incidentaloma, it's less than 0.2% chance that it'd be cancer with that logic. A finding in the liver, a liver nodule, less than 0.5, again, a half a percent. In the thyroid, it's less than 0.01%, less than one in 10,000. So, maybe an easier way to think about it is what are the chances these things aren't important? And this is the highest possible, you know, that these are the highest possible chances they could be cancer. Over 90% of the time, these are nothing. And with the exception of a lung nodule and a smoker, it's all more than 99% of the time it's nothing. And yet it triggers us to intervene. And those interventions cause problems. By the way, this is cancer of the kidney it has a totally stable mortality rate. We're finding twice as much kidney cancer now as we were back in 1975. We're not screening for kidney cancer. We're just doing a lot of cross-sectional imaging and a lot of people are being told something's wrong with their kidney. It's a common, common incidental loma. All right, let's move forward. There's been a big shift in paradigms in my profession. <clears throat> the old paradigm was we made diagnoses in patients who are experiencing problems. That was the old paradigm. The new paradigm is to seek diagnoses in people who are not experiencing problems. That's what early diagnosis is about. It's seeking things to be wrong in the well. 
Now, I want to be clear, I don't think the paradigm of early diagnosis is always wrong. It's not that simple. We would much rather repair a deep laceration in the skin soon after it occurs than to have you come in a week later with an infected wound, right? We'd much rather do that. We'd rather see patients early in the course of their pneumonia than wait until they develop dyspnea and sepsis. We'd rather see patients early in the course of their heart attack until, and then wait until they develop an arrhythmia or low blood pressure. And we'd rather see women with a small breast lump than wait until they develop a large breast mass. The question I'm raising is how often should we get ahead of symptoms? How often should we get, so, you know, if you've got something wrong, you feel it, you can go to your doctor. The question is, should you be going to your doctor when you're well to find out if something's wrong? In the past, doctors treated a population, they didn't even know about the population, but conceptually it was out there. And they waited for problems to develop. And then they diagnosed and treat. The ideal for early diagnosis was simple. It, it would be to take that same population and find those patients earlier. With the idea, with what you found earlier, were destined to be those that were going to appear anyway. That was the ideal. But that's not the reality at all. The current reality is that when you early diagnosis, you find a whole bunch more patients. A whole lot more patients than you did in the past. Now that means the future course of those patients is a little bit more complicated. That natural history, what would happen if we hadn't found them? Well, some, hopefully, are those that are destined to develop problems, although that's not necessarily, or we may still miss the ones that are destined to cause problems. But whatever, we've now got a group that's not destined to cause problems. And they're the overdiagnosed and needlessly treated. I want to be clear, nothing good can happen to this group. Nothing good. All experience the impact of diagnosis. And particularly a cancer diagnosis, we shouldn't downplay what that does to people. It makes them feel much more vulnerable, worried about their future. And in this country, it can affect their ability to get health insurance. Hopefully the president's fixed that, but I don't know yet. But it definitely has real impact just giving people diagnoses. Most experience the impact of intervention, all those hassle factors. You know, you have to have subsequent appointments, more testing, surveillance, phone calls, filling scripts, handing in insurance forms, on and on and on and on, as medical care becomes a bigger part of people's lives. And then some experience harm from the intervention. Medication side effects, surgical complications, and yes, even death. People die from medical care. And this is a problem. This is a big problem. And, and, and I say to myself, how did we get here? You know, how did we get to this point? And in this country, it really becomes a question of who's to blame, right? That's really what you want. And I don't know how many of you are from my generation, but whenever that who to blame <laughs> thing comes up, Right? Is this a good guy to pick on? Oh, he's a Californian. Oh, jeez. Should have changed the slide. OK. And ironically, it really is Dick Nixon to blame. Um, Nixon promoted a new national health strategy to replace the traditional system that operates episodically within a logical incentive that rewards illness. And I think he was doing this with the best of intentions. And he, 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 this was one of the speeches he, he worked on. We need to work out a system that includes a greater emphasis on preventive care. And this was part of the Health uh, Maintenance Organization Act, in uh, uh, the HMO Act in 1973. It was a major portion of the legislation of the war on cancer. It was a focus on prevention. And I think what happened is we failed to distinguish between two basic types of prevention. Preventive medicine has really two very distinct uh, things. One is health promotion, and the other is early diagnosis. And early diagnosis is what a test would tell you. That's what I mean. Th th this is the effort to get ahead of symptoms. And I think about, this is my Volvo. 
It's a 99 Volvo cross country. You know, I'm from New England, and uh, I don't know. If you, any of you guys have these lights on your cars? Let me. Uh, <laughs> this is my early diagnosis nightmare. Uh, in the Volvo, even though it's 1999, it's over 10 years old, it's monitoring actually about 200 different functions of the car. And I'm sure you've had the experience of one going on and having to go and take it into the shop. It always means you've got to go to the shop. And some of you may have had the unfortunate experience of uh, well, the one that the mechanic may have told you to ignore it, but that's unlikely. Uh, but, but the mechanic did an intervention that actually didn't help, and it still went on, or you were out a lot of money, or actually the car was worse. Um, this is actually what my dashboard looks like now. I actually have three on. Um, <laughs> I, I've come to just to I ignore them. I have a second car. It's a 2005 uh, Outback. And it, 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 for the first time, its check engine light uh, went on. And I didn't realize what an advance uh, things had happened between 1999 and 2005. Because when this check engine light goes on, all of a sudden your cruise control starts to flash. Now, this actually has nothing to do with why the check engine light goes on. But what they're doing is they're disabling your cruise control until you, does anyone have this on their car? I, now this is serious. The cruise control won't work until you get your check engine light. I couldn't believe how, you know, like, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> it's coercive. If you don't get a mammogram, I'm gonna stop treating your really high blood pressure. That's the, sa that's the logic, and by the way, that happens. Women have been told they can no longer be in a practice if they don't want to get a man. Why? Because the doctors are being measured on it. It's crazy. Oh, and this is me before early days. This is me in high school. <laughs> this is a 65 Ford Fairlane where none of this was going on, okay? It is a good car, okay. <laughs> now, health promotion's a totally different thing, right? It's what your grandmother would have told you. And the analogy, I think, for a car <laughs> is to change your oil, or to keep your tires inflated, or to wash the salt off in the spring. When you guys don't have to worry about that. In Vermont, we got to wash the salt off our car every year. Right? It's basic preventive maintenance. Nothing's being alerted. Nothing's in saying that it's wrong. No one's identifying a problem. It's just good mechanical care. And what would your grandmother have told you? Well, she would have told you not to smoke. She would have told you to eat your fruits and vegetables. And maybe she would have said to eat your starchy vegetables. I don't know. <laughs> and she'd say, go play outside. Right? Move. Get up. Walk. Do it. The basic idea here was to be healthy, was to do something positive, things that you gave you a sense of reliance, confidence. Not confidence kills, confidence lives. Right? The basic idea here is to look hard for things to be wrong. Very, very different. <laughs> now, here's a question for you. Is looking hard for things to be wrong a good thing for a healthcare system to do? That's the question I'm posing to other doctors. Is that really a good thing for a healthcare system to do? Alert patients before doctors get sick. <laughs> IBM says that's smarter healthcare for a smarter planet. But I wonder if it's a recipe for a sicker plan. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll be happy to answer uh, any questions. I know everybody has one question on their mind. Dr. Welch, you get PSA tests done? Do I have, no, oh no. Does your wife get mammograms? My wife does not uh, get, well, she, she does get them. My, my wife has breast cancer. I guess I shouldn't, uh, I don't need to keep that a secret because it's in the book. Yes. 
uh, it, it was a, uh, let's see, I, I'm always nervous about talking about this, but I realized, wait a minute, it's in the book. <laughs> <laughs> and she cleared it, so uh, I, I'm okay. But uh, about uh, 10 years ago, um, she uh, had a clinically detected breast cancer, not a mammographically detected cancer. But she does now have, uh, as a prior cancer patient, she now has mammograms. What is your recommendation? Uh, I, I don't get involved. Do you recommend things to your wife? <laughs> You, you, has, you have a different relationship than I do. If you I come guess. back here to answer, to ask questions, uh, <laughs> we're going to ask questions from this point. If anybody has a question, would you come on right here? And yeah, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I, uh, I also have some copies of uh, Dr. Welch's new book, which you'd be happy to sign. So if any of you would like to get a copy. And, of and you can read about Linda. They're $15. You can also read about my daughter. I think she gets it. Yeah, it's a great book. Yeah. In fact, I enjoyed it very, very much. I'd highly recommend it. Yes. So I had this thing, and uh, <clears throat> I had this thing, and got an MRI scan of it. And because of some dental work, the scan didn't come out good. The scan didn't come out very good. And uh, the doctor wouldn't call me back. Uh, the guy who wrote up the uh, scan report just said, "Well, you can't see it very well." And my question is, does all this extra over testing? cause the sensitivity on the scans to go down. Now are we looking at them less well because there's so many? Oh, boy. That's actually a really good question. I, I think the short answer is yes, but let me take a drink of water and I'll give you a longer one. <laughs> it, it's actually a fascinating question, and, and, and I, let me recast it a little bit. Um, I, I, I think at least what I hear you saying, is it possible now that the radiologists are getting so much information that they lose the forest for the trees? And uh, the answer to that is yes. And it's a very interesting problem. And I, I as I say, I, I work at the VA hospital and, and I, I saw a patient um, who had acute abdominal pain and it was it was intermittent and it was very well localized. It was right up under his diaphragm. And it would come and go, and that's the hardest thing to evaluate when you're gonna, it doesn't always happen. But he came into the ER once and I said, boy, once you start going to the ER with your pain, that's about the time where I'm gonna use advanced imaging. And, I, and I, I, every once in a while I order a CT scan. So I, I, I do it, because it's a good test. And I, I but I prepared him. This is one of the great things about getting older. You, you, you actually learn. And, 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 and I just sort of written the incidental Loma chapter and I said, you know, I'm going to order a, 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 an abdominal CAT scan we're gonna, and we're going to see a lot. And I predict someone's going to say there's something on your liver, there's something on your kidney. And, and I, I had the sense to sort of have him ready uh, for, for this. Um, and that I was going to say the, that many things that we would be told about, I was going to tell him to ignore. And so he gets the CAT scan, and um, there are actually uh, six uh, diagnoses uh, on it. Um, and and it, it's, it's a, a, a bunch of findings in the liver, something in the pancreas, all of which I think were, were nothing. They're tiny, tiny, they're millimeters in size. A very, very carefully done report with uh, six diagnoses, none of which addressed the chief complaint, you know, the reason the exam was being done. And it was done by uh, a, a new uh, radiologist, a very junior uh, person, and, and, and it, was a, it was, you know, I think most people would say it was a, you know, a shining example of a carefully worded and very detailed radiology report, except it didn't deal with the problem at hand. So, when that happens, I actually walk up to radiology. That's one of the nice things about being in a small hospital. And, and I, the, our senior radiologist, I know real well, and we get in a lot of fights, and, but we, he's basically on my team, and, and um, he understands all the problems. And I said, Jim, and he's about five years older than me, 
And I said, Jim, could you look at this CT scan? I want to tell you what the patient's problem is, and I don't want to hear about everything else you can, can see on it. And the first thing I was impressed by was just how many images there were and how many different ways he can look at them. I mean, there's both the, the, the film, which you can look at, but now you're reading it on a computer with a very large screen, and you virtually can move through any degree of, they're reconstructing the images so you can now move up at, at a half centimeter at a time, and you, you may have 200 slices, and then you can rotate it and look at it a bunch of different ways. You know, you can be looking at it in this angle, you can be looking at this angle, and then you can change the amount of contrast and the depth. So, so there's innumerable possibilities. But what he does first is it can reconstruct a flat plate x-ray of the abdomen. What would have been done when I was in Alaska 30 years ago. A simple flat plate like a chest x-ray except it's of the abdomen. And that's where he started. He made a very fancy GT Siemens uh, 30 dimensional image into a old x-ray. And he saw exactly the problem, that there was bowel, and this is actually a, gene a, 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 a genetic variant that some people have, where the colon goes quite high above the liver, and he had a name for it, I can't even remember, some of them here may know the name for that uh, thing, where there's literally a loop of bowel. And the only way to see it, though, was to get back to that step back image and look at the big picture. And I think that's an example of the problem I think you were alluding to, is that just because you have more data, you may actually lose information if you're not careful. You just get cluttered, you get overload, and you're looking at the detail and you're not seeing the big picture. I don't know if that addresses what you're talking about, but it, it reminded me of this story that happened just a few weeks ago. Do you, you, you want to follow up? Or? Yeah, they, they looked at the scan, and because of the dental work, the scan in the area of interest wasn't quite clear. And then it was like that was it, because they couldn't see anything on that scan. They wouldn't return phone calls or, you know, order a CT, that was MRI. Yeah, there's no, nothing that G General Electric or Siemens can do to get us to return phone calls. Huh? That, that's, a, that's a separate problem. But, 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 but uh, I, I, th that's another issue that um, I, I hear you. They were real interested in the thing before I got scanned. I got a crappy scan, and then they just didn't but, seem to care. Then they're not interested, yeah. Is there another question yes. uh, about pulmonary embolism? Yes. It seems to be in the media, maybe it's an overdiagnosis problem as well. With air travel, you know, the increased incidence of pulmonary embolism. I, I couldn't quite out. hear you. Okay. There's a, there seems to be an increased incidence, according to media, uh, of pulmonary air, travel, embolism. air travel yeah, causing yeah. pulmonary embolism. Yeah. Is that another overdiagnosis problem? I, I think it probably is. I think, I, 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 again, if you get in a scanner, uh, we're now recognizing a lot of people have very small emboli, even young people. Um, and um, the, 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 we've really got to be careful that we're not anticoagulating people unnecessarily, because it's not a good thing. Yeah, so I, I think that is probably part of the air travel story. By the way, that's a problem with a lot of, you know, when we're looking at sort of risks for things, these analyses of, you know, who's at risk. Once someone's said to be at risk, all of a sudden they're looked at more carefully and it can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's not like this is this, this uh, I hope one of the things you walk away from my talk tonight is people don't either have disease or not have disease. There's an incredible spectrum in between. And so a fu one, one function of to what extent people are said that, that someone is abnormal is a function of how hard we've looked at them. So risk factors can become self-fulfilling if it drives doctors to be looking at things harder because they assume the patient is at higher risk and they find more things. I think uh, the problem with um Overdiagnosis is more complex than that. The problem is that with improved diagnostic technology, um, if the doctor does not use them, then the patient sues the, uh, the doctor for delayed or misdiagnosis. I think the, pro the, the solution is to stop improving our diagnostic technology. <laughs> 
or, or get rid of the hungry attorneys? <laughs> well, uh, I, 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 uh, I'm, I'm going to be the last one to uh, uh, defend attorneys. I mean, I have as much fun with lawyer jokes as anybody. <laughs> Um, and, and clearly, and I've been clear about that, I, I think uh, particularly in the mammographic uh, recall rate, you know, attorneys are a big part of the story. They're not the only part of the story, though, and I think my profession is, is, is too glib in, in, in always sort of uh, finding this external uh, uh, source to blame. I, I, think, I, I think malpractice is an important consideration, but it's by no means the only thing driving this. Um, and, and I talk a little bit about this in the book. I, I call it a complex web. But I want to be clear that for, first, there's an awful lot of money involved. I mean, we're talking, the, the, you know, moving into the well population is, is a great way to expand markets. It is just, you know, it's just a lot easier to move into the well population than it is to actually develop a better drug or a better, it's just, and, and it's not just drug companies. I, I mean, everyone likes to beat up on drug companies. It's our hospitals too, it's academic medical centers. So money's a big part of this story. Um, but I also want to be clear, true belief is a big part of this story. That there are people who genuinely believe this is the best thing to do, and they're not necessarily conflicted by money, they're not being influenced by the, doc, by the lawyers, it's a genuine belief with, held with almost religious fervor. Um, and uh, that's one of the things that I'm trying to deal with, so people understand why there are two sides to looking for early problems. Um, and, and then the, the media, inadvertently, with the survivor stories, sets the whole ball rolling because everyone has a hard time seeing a survivor as anything other than someone who's benefited. But the reality is more likely they've been uh, treated and identified unnecessarily. Until we deal with that uh, problem, the, the public will, uh, will be confused. And, and it's understandably so. It's a very difficult conceptual problem. Uh, Dr. Welch, um, yeah. you've made me want to uh, confess in front of everybody, I'm a radiologist. Oh, yeah! <laughs> hey, some of my best friends are radiologists. <laughs> you, you may know yeah. that it was a radiologist that got me started in this. It was a Dartmouth radiologist, Bill Black, just so, in case you know him. Go ahead. So I knew you were going to be speaking and uh, I read your book and I knew that my profession was going to be on the sort of choppy block in a, in a way and um, I wanted to speak uh, on two about two things one is uh, and I echo what Dr. McDougall says is that it's important for us to take uh, personal responsibility for our health and to ask our doctors questions about the value of what's being ordered, and in particular, uh, since half of the room is women, uh, the issue of mammography has been very contentious, and there have been uh, basically two camps. One camp that says that mammography is important, and uh, in 2009, there was a big report coming out with the change in screening recommendations, and uh, then there's another camp that says that uh, it's been oversold. And of course, Dr. McDougall is on that, that camp. And um, I just like to tell people that as a radiologist, I look at uh, my role in uh, mammography as a duty. Um, my practice is small. I probably read 2,000, 2,500 mammograms a year. I'm not a breast, speci breast imaging specialist, but I do because it's part of my general radiology practice. And um, I have caught breast cancer, those small breast cancers. I have missed breast cancers. I've had women who I've done biopsies on who uh, um, it comes back negative. I've had them come back positive. Um, I don't know who I'm doing good for or who I'm not, who would fall into that category of overdiagnosed. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a problem that I, I'm glad you wrote wrote your book and you make you raise this issue because uh, I don't I don't do mammar I don't read mammograms um, other, 
we feel it's a public service. I mean, it's not, uh, if you're a radiologist, you, mammography uh, takes time. It's very, it's very stressful. It's one of the things that gets a radiologist sued more often than anything else. And uh, so it's a stressful thing for us to do, but we still feel like we're doing a, a service. And, um, you know, there is data out there. I just want people to know that um, from 1991 to 2006, um, you know, 50, 50 years before that, the, the uh, breast cancer uh, death rate in the United States stayed unchanged. And when screening went into effect, it went down by, with good estimates, 30%. Now, some of that could be due to better treatment some due to uh, screening. But that equals 75,000 lives um, in this country. And so your graph that showed a slight decrease in the death rate of breast cancer represents 75,000 lives. That, 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 that's right. And the area under the curve of the additional diagnoses is about uh, 1.3 million. So uh, th there's a trade-off here. But, but I want to be clear about that declining death rate. Uh, and everyone is very quick, I think, and to, to attribute that to early detection. But the real good news in breast cancer is the advance in treatment. And the early breast cancer trialists have been very clear on that, that the advent of adjuvant chemotherapy and the anti-estrogen uh, drugs, um, in the trials, their net effect is about a 50% reduction in mortality, uh, the summary estimates of the trials. I think most, uh, first, you and I agree, declining breast cancer mortality is a good thing. No question about that. Why it's happening, we'll both agree, is more complex of a question. Uh, th th that's uh, something to be clear about. Um, I appreciate your comments, and, and it is very difficult to know what the real effects of mammography are. And, uh, you know, I think one of the things I tell people is, you know, this is, a, this is a problem we've studied as well as anything, right? We've randomized over a half million women uh, nation, uh, worldwide into studies of screening. And the fact that there's still a lot of debate about it, I think, tells you something. It's not, a sli it's not like the VA cooperative study of treating really high blood pressure. It is a very close call, and we're looking for small effects. And it's hard. I, I, that's the only thing, and, and I know your job is hard. And by the way, when we're talking about money, I don't think money has a lot to do with the mammography story. There is some money there, but a lot of it is much more about uh, true belief. And, there, and as I th think you'll add into me, it's, it's not a big remuneration thing for you either, right? This is not a big part of your practice. And uh, so it, th these are very uh, difficult issues, uh, and um, I, I, I believe that, that we really haven't told the full effect of mammography, that the problems that it creates. We, we focused on that benefit side for which there's debate about to what extent it exists. Uh, and we haven't been clear about the downside. And it certainly shouldn't be the measure of how good a healthcare system is. It, it is not, it, if it's the most important thing we do, um, I think we've missed the boat. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Dr. Welch, that was a, a, an amazing presentation. I think everybody has a much clearer understanding about, about the options and the fact that you're not going just for the cure. Uh, there's a, a big price to be paid for that cure. And uh, I want to thank you very much. Thank you. Good night. We'll be uh, getting back together again. Breakfast is at uh, 6.30. And uh, we start again promptly at 8 o'clock. So you have a good night rest. We have a big day ahead of us tomorrow. Good night. Dr. Welch will be signing his books. He has his books outside.